All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started in just a moment, but a few remarks before we begin. Um, we are recording today's event, and the video will be available in a couple of weeks on the Basic Science website. It's basicscience.berkeley.edu. You'll be able to view this video as well as other videos this, from this season and prior seasons. Um, due to the large number of attendees, we are going to keep the audience muted, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have questions for any of today's speakers, please post them in the chat. We will try to get to as many of your questions as we can um, during the hour. And um, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the Assistant Dean of Development for Mathematical and Physical Sciences, Maria Yelm. Good evening, or almost evening, and uh, welcome to Basic Science Lights the, the Way, and a uh, very happy Passover to those of you celebrating this evening at sundown. I am stepping in for Dean Steve Kahn, um, because I believe he has not gotten out of a thesis defense in time to join us, so um, uh, forgive us for that. Um, hopefully he'll be able to join us later, but... Um, I think the thesis defense uh, needs to needs to take priority. So anyway, um, tonight our topic is uh, mathematics that matter. Uh, as you know, you mathematics is ubiquitous to the human experience. It is often one of the first subjects to challenge students in school, and it is one of the few disciplines used in our daily lives. The universal language of mathematics serves as the foundation for so many scientific disciplines. Science and math are inextricably linked and the era of big data has only underscored that the discipline remains the backbone to our research. So tonight we will be discussing emerging topics from the field of applied mathematics. Applied mathematics is the practical utilization of mathematical methods, by different disciplines such as physics, engineering, medicine, biology, finance, business, computer science, and all industry. Thus, applied mathematics is a combination of mathematical science and specialized knowledge. Its relevance in myriad fields and careers, along with its tangible impact, has made applied mathematics Berkeley's most popular undergraduate major. I do wanna make note, however, that the title of this evening's event, Mathematics That Matter, is not a judgment of pure math. Pure mathematics is, of course, extremely important and Berkeley is one of the world's great leaders in, in pure math. And ultimately, all mathematics is important and leads to breakthroughs. Thus, this series and the importance of basic science research. So once we are underway, I hope you will post your questions for any of our speakers in the chat box. We will answer as many of them as we can. And I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, but also our first speaker, uh, Professor Per Olaf Persson, professor in the Department of Mathematics and a mathematician faculty science at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Professor Persson's research interests are in computational methods for partial differential equations with applications in areas such as fluid and solid mechanics. He has developed new finite element discontinuous Galerkin numerical methods, parallel preconditioners and curved mesh generators. He's also an expert in presenting these highly intellectual concepts in a simple engaging way. Thank God for that. Over to you, Pear. Thank you, Maria. I'm excited to be here as both the host and the first speaker at tonight's event. Um, as you know, I and two colleagues from the Department of Mathematics will be presenting some of our current research topics in applied mathematics. Faculty and students inter interested in applications of mathematics are an integral part of the Department of Mathematics at Berkeley. We have no formal separation between pure and applied mathematics. And uh, our department actually takes pride in the many ways in which they enrich each other. Topics explored intensively by our faculty and students in recent years include scientific computations and the mathem mathematical aspects of quantum theory, computational genomics, image processing, medical imaging, inverse problems, robotics, biodemography, population genetics, uh, 
uh, phylogenetics and computational appro approaches to historical linguistics. And some of these topics will be discussed here this evening. So at the end of each talk, we will try to address uh, all or some of the questions from uh, you. So please add questions if you can in the chat. Uh, and now I'm going to go ahead and give the introductory talk, which I hope will lay the groundwork for this evening and give you some sense of my own research and the field that we work in. So I would like to start off with a term that you may or may not have seen before, computational science and engineering. Uh, it actually has become the term that is widely used to describe a broad field that describes very well uh, what I do. Uh, when people ask me what I do, sometimes I say, of course, mathematics, sometimes applied mathematics. I might say numerical analysis. That used to be a term we used a lot, but it's a little specific and focuses a lot on the analysis, maybe, which is not all of it. Uh, I might say something very detailed, like uh, numerical methods for solving partial differential equations. Uh, but most likely, I would probably say exactly this. I'm, I work in computational science and engineering. Uh, and it's a, it's a good term, I think. It describes that uh, we scientists, engineers, and mathematicians, uh, we get together to try to... Uh, and what is the definition? Well, the first bullet here I took from Wikipedia, actually. Constructing mathematical models and numerical solution techniques uh, and using computers to analyze and solve scientific and engineering problems. So, for example, down here we have... A, uh, visualization of a uh, Falcon aircraft. And one typical simulation that I've been involved with a lot in collaboration with uh, the US Air Force and NASA is uh, the airflow around, uh, for example, airplanes. And typically you want to predict before you build the airplane how it would uh, perform and perhaps improve it before you even build it. Uh, to the right, you have a picture of uh, uh, the air acoustics uh, making, making sound around a musical instrument. Uh, I personally love the field because it's very inter interdisciplinary. Of course, it's a lot of mathematics, but it's also a lot of computer science and computing and programming, which, which I always loved. Uh, and of course, you apply it to physical problems and engineering design. So this is the main reason I fell for this subject so much. Just one slide arguing why do we need mathematical research in computations. Uh, so first of all, you will see, and I will, I will explain why these methods Mathematics show up all over the place uh, in every little piece of it, and uh, we just need new developments. And secondly, since it is so important throughout academia and industry, why not uh, try to be part of it and, and get it's easy to get attention from, from the world in general and, and of course, uh, funding from, from, uh, from the government and, and, and even companies who are interested in these fields. I'd like to start off by saying how the typical numerical simulation process looks like and this is again in order to highlight how diverse it is and how many different components that all depend on mathematics are there. So I have one slide each for, uh, for each of these bullet points coming up, but let me first just say that these are the steps. The first is the mathematical modeling, which is actually not numerical or computational. It's when we sit down and say, here's a partial differential equation that describes the problem you want to solve and things like domains, boundary conditions, et cetera. Secondly, you need to take that domain and turn it in and tell the computer about it. And this is an even bigger field than simulation called CAD or computer aided design. Now I'll briefly show a picture of that as well. Now uh, this model, the CAD model is usually not suitable for the type of numerical methods that we have that can solve these PDs. So the next step is usually what's called mesh generation. Uh, and it's actually when you decompose the domain you want to solve into smaller geometric shapes like triangles and tetrahedra that we can handle with simpler mathematical method, uh, methods and combine into, into a solution that approximates the original problem. The next step is what I would say is the traditional numerical methods and numerical analysis, which is when we now develop methods that can solve these PDs on these meshes. Finally, uh, but not the least, you got to do something with your results. And even that has tons of mathematics where you perhaps just look at the results or compute quantities that you want to want to study. And of course, all these can be repeated over and over in an optimization process to iteratively design something. So just quickly, the mathematical modeling, uh, the world has been described by PDs, almost every type of thing happening in the world, not just the physics, even things like the, the traffic flow on freeways can be described by partial differential equations. Uh, I will show examples from Navier-Stokes equations that shows fluid dynamics, for example, 
But if you wanted to simulate the, the radiation from a cell phone, you might want to use the Maxwell's equation. So this is basically the basics where we sit down and use traditional applied mathematics to describe, uh, get a mathematical formulation of our the, the physical problem we want to study or engineering problem. I mentioned CAD. This is when we take a domain, uh, like this tool, for example, and describe using a computer. Uh, I think you can imagine the amount of mathematics that goes into the description of these curves and shapes and how they fit together. Uh, typically, we use something called NURBS surfaces, and it's mathematics all over the place and numerical methods, actually, to compute intersections and, and, and representations of these objects. The next step was this mesh generation where I take a domain, like, for example, suppose I want to simulate the airflow around this aircraft. I would then have to fill it with these blue tetrahedra and the green tri and, and gray triangles on the surfaces in order to be able to use my numerical method. This by itself is, of course, an enormous field that I personally have, have worked a lot in. And uh, there are a lot I can say about it. But for now, just saying that this comes in between the, the, the full geometry of the CAD geometry and the numerical method. So uh, now comes the numerical solution techniques here. So the middle equation here, not that I expect, uh, I will not go into the details, of course, but that's a, one of the type of so-called finite element measures that I work with, the discontinuous Galerkin method, that can be actually shown to, under some circumstances, uh, correctly and accurately solve the partial differential equations that we have. Uh, this leads to big matrix equations, uh, typically big nonlinear, or, or, or linear systems that you need to solve, typically on supercomputers, like in the picture down here to the right. Uh, and in fact, uh, our third speaker, Olga, will talk more about how to solve big linear systems later. And the final step was this post-processing processing visualization. It's always important, if nothing else, because it creates beautiful, pretty pictures that people enjoy looking at. Uh, but it's, of course, very important. You got to do something with the result. To the right, you have the turbulent flow around an, a, a single airfoil. And, and you, can, you can do this to study, for example, the separation and the, the formation, the transition to turbulence. To the left, I have an animation of an elastic, highly elastic and, and deformable rubber object uh, that, is, that is back to its original state. Uh, I'd like to show just uh, after this introduction, a little intro, just a little piece of my recent research and what I focus on uh, by an example that combines all these concepts. So I've been working a lot on not just solving the PDs, but also trying to optimize them. So here's an example of how I can optimize a flapping wing. And there it will actually not fly. So it's more like a swimming fish. But I could add gravity if I wanted to. But this is a model problem. So we can actually solve these types of, of optimization problems. We can optimize something or minimize some sort of functional subject to the PD itself. So of course, the PD has to be solved because it models nature. So that's always true. We can also put on extra constraints, for example, that this flap swimming fish should make sure that it propels itself or accelerates, for example. So I will not go into details, but one important thing these optimizers need is a derivative. And there is an, a remarkable technique called the adjoint method that allows us to basically compute derivatives of extremely complicated processes. Uh, here's my model problem. I want to solve, uh, so again, I have a little fish or a wing that would uh, swim up and down in a, in a sort of motion that I'm trying to figure out. So that's what I'm solving for, an optimal motion. I want to minimize the energy because we believe that's what, energy, what the nature does. And if you were swimming in the ocean, you would probably also try to propel yourself as fast as possible without getting too tired. Uh, but subject to a thrust constraint, namely that, for example, you want to accelerate or keep on cruising, that would be a neutral mode, for example. And here are some basic properties of the flow, but let me just show the results. So to the left here, I take this wing and I just heave it up down in a, a periodic motion. You see the fluid flow around it is uh, uh, uses a lot of shedding. This is an inefficient way of swimming. It actually does accelerate very little bit, but it uses a lot of energy. Not a good swimmer. It's like you trying to swim, but by just moving your hand up and down. If I solve using this framework, I can for less than a magnitude of the energy get a neutral motion with very little shedding, but this guy, th this version of this of the flapping motion, which will actually keep on swimming and exactly overcome the thrust uh, or the drag from the fluid. Suppose I want to accelerate aggressively. I can tell it to give me an X impulse of negative 2.5 in whatever units this is done in, and I have the energy of the initial motion. I can do this is an optimal design. And what I find fascinating about this is that uh, biologists have studied, for example, birds and fish. And they know how they swim. 
the technique here is basically in this type of regime is that you just push enough in order to shed a so-called leading edge vortex and then you use your tail to flip around and extract the momentum and propel yourself forward i did not put that information into this i just used the mathematics i gave it the equations of the fluid flow and asked for an energetically optimal motion that satisfied my constraints so i think that's pretty amazing that i rediscovered how nature has also come up with these motions by doing this uh, one little modification i can do more sophisticated motions like this guy here it's hard to see in the in the animation, but it's actually deforming as it goes up and down and, and bending. And then, of course, you can create more advanced design. This is something that animals would typically do. They can, for example, soften their wing on the upstroke or the downstroke to create different types of, um, types, of, types of motions. But this is just one example. You can imagine how this would be done at a company like Boeing for optimizing. Hopefully, they're not flapping that much, but their wings are moving, uh, if nothing else, because of the elasticity. And they would like to optimize designs to achieve certain objectives. But uh, I'm going to end my talk there and just summarize by saying numerical simulations are crucial for current and future advances in engineering and science. And again, the thing I love the most about it is that it contains all these topics that I, I, I don't want to just pick one of them. I want to work with mathematics and, and physics and computer sci science at the same time. So thank you very much. I'm going to end there. Now, since I am the moderator, I am also going to look at some of your questions and try to answer them myself. Uh, excellent question. How has AI affected your field? Um, a lot. Um, for many years, I would say the last 10 years, uh, first of all, uh, a lot of grant opportunities and funding opportunities have tried to push this. So I would say that uh, easily a half of my colleagues, including myself, are exploring AI. I would say it's slightly divisive. Some people think it's not going to create uh, enormous results. Some people think that we can stop everything we used to do and, and this will change everything. Uh, I don't think it has had quite the same revolutionary effect on some partial differential equations, or I know it hasn't, as it has had, for example, on, on games and the things that you read in the news. Or, uh, But I think it might have. Personally, I work on the mesh generation. I have an excellent student right now working on how to do discrete. It's like a game, but, but it's to produce optimal meshes with optimal connectivity. He's using something called deep reinforcement learning to do that. So it's going to happen and it's going to be explored. And I, over the next few years, people are going to figure out exactly how I, AI will, will change our field. Uh, what is PD? I'm sorry, I went very quickly about that. That is a partial differential equation. And it's... Um, so it's something we don't really teach. I guess we teach it very quickly in our second year undergrad course on, on multivariate calculus, but then we have upper level courses that teach it more. And it's basically something like the Navier-Stokes equation, an equation that describes the velocities or the fluid flow or the densities and the pressures that we can solve in order to model nature. And this is what scientists and engineers do. Uh, and another question is uh, if I can describe any techniques I use for determining when the accuracy of simulation is not so good? Um, great question. So we divide into um, um, methods that you can analyze even before you solve it. So there are statements we can make when we prove convergence that given these conditions, we can guarantee that the solution has a certain accuracy. Uh, but we also have so so-called uh, a posteriori methods where you first solve and then you look at the accuracy and you try to do so-called error estimators based on what you have. They're usually not provably exact. They are just approximate, but that's typically sufficient for what we're looking for. And, uh, uh, and, and what happens if it's not accurate enough is that you have to rerun it maybe on a finer grid, a more accurate method, or you need, to, uh, you need to change it in some way. All right, thank you so much for those excellent questions. I'm going to move away from my research and I'm going to move on to our second speaker, uh, which is uh, Kritika Tavli. Uh, she is a Moray visiting assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at UC Berkeley. Kritika obtained her PhD from Indiana University, Bloomington in 2022 and joined UC Berkeley last fall. Her research interests include deterministic and stochastic nonlinear partial differential equations. These are the same PDs as I discussed arising from fluid dynamics, geophysics, and material science. Kritika, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and over to you. Thank you, Pero, for the introduction, and uh, my thanks to the organizers for inviting me today to give this short presentation on my um, ongoing research. 
So um, like Bear already mentioned, I work on uh, stochastic partial differential equations. That's a subset of the research that I do. And today in particular, I'll be uh, talking about certain stochastic fluid structure interaction models um, that um, I've been recently interested in. So um, FSI or fluid structure interaction models are of course of high interest in several fields of science and engineering. But here are just a few of the examples um, uh, that I cherry picked. Uh, uh, so, some of these, I guess, picture simulations you've already seen in Bear's um, talk. Um, so for example, here you can see uh, the wings of an aircraft or the blades of a turbine interacting with the air surrounding it. And in this video, uh, you can see the, the, the craziness uh, that happened in 1940s. This is the um, Tacoma and Arrows Bridge uh, that eventually collapsed after oscillating in this unbelievable fashion. Anyways, um, I'm not an engineer, but today I'd like to uh, present a mathematical perspective of FSI, uh, keeping real life applications in mind. And uh, at the same time, I'll also try to keep um, this talk very general and reachable. Um, okay, so um, most of these points were already very uh, nicely presented by Pear, but uh, let me just reiterate. As applied mathematicians, what we try to do is, for one, find mathematical models that describe physically relevant systems um, so that they're applicable in, uh, in real life. Um, then we um, analyze these problems to figure out whether the proposed model even makes sense. And uh, we develop numerical methods to, uh, that are then fed to a computer so that uh, we have simulations for these highly complex phenomena. So um, let me move on to the FSI models that I'm interested in. Since I joined the Department of Mathematics um, here at Berkeley last, uh, last fall, um, I've been working with my postdoc mentor, Professor Chanich, on um, studying certain fluid structure interaction models uh, that have applications in medicine. So other than the fact that these are highly interesting math problems, they're also important from um, an application point of view. because. Uh, just a little bit of motivation here. Um, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death today. And it's believed that if prognosed and diagnosed at an early stage, this high mortality rate could be brought down. So that's why it's, it's of course, uh, of high importance to study how blood flow, for example, and blood pressure interacts with other components of a cardiovascular system. So in this simulation here, you're seeing a pressure wave that's propagating and displacing, uh, propagating through and displacing this um, elastic sort of a tube. Um, so very briefly, just a little bit of um, the kind of equations that I study. Um, here uh, we have a, a elastic or a viscoelastic structure um, and a fluid flow that is flowing inside of this structure. And what I wanna do is understand how these two uh, entities interact with each other. So the equations that you're seeing in the bottom describe the fluid flow where U is the velocity of the fluid and is a unknown in the problem. Uh, we wanna solve for this U. And on top, you're seeing an equation for the structure displacement, uh, which tells you exactly what the structure would look like at some point in time. So these are PDEs. Uh, these are uh, equations uh, or, or PDEs in general, like Bear said, describe any, um, uh, describe the world. So, um, uh, here just a, a small comment. This is a deterministic model uh, in the sense that you give me some initial data and I'll be exactly able to tell you what happens uh, at a future state uh, using these equations. But uh, the prediction of this future state depends very highly on how accurately this initial state is presented to me. And of course, as you can see in this angiogram here, 
um, our real systems cannot completely be isolated from their surroundings and their environments, which can be very uh, noisy in nature. Um, and so to account for numerical errors uh, that can happen and physical uncertainties in applications, we add some kind of randomness or stochastic forcing to our models. And that's where um, I come in, or, or that's the, the field that I'm studying. Um, so um, we add the stochastic forcing or some randomness to our system and then try to figure out if these underlying deterministic systems are still robust to this external roughness. Uh, these are computationally and from a mathematical point of view, very challenging and complex systems because not only are we trying to solve these fluid equations in a moving domain, but the domain itself, uh, the configuration of this moving domain is also not known a priori. And on top of that, they're all um, random in nature and they account for all possible configurations and all possible fluid velocities that can uh, happen. So um, uh, what I'm interested in is for one, proving well posedness of this problem. We wanna be able to say that, okay, we have this model, but does it have a solution? If it's describing something physical, then we wanna be able to come up with a solution. And after that, of course, uh, I mean, what I work on in general is construction of numerical schemes for such stochastic models uh, so that they have, they can be applied in real life. Here, you're seeing another simulation of a stent um, inside this elastic tube, uh, which is under stress. So um, I think I'm nearing the end of my time. So I'll stop my presentation here and thank you all for your attention. Thanks for your presentation, Kritika. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you. Um, how does your current research build on your PhD work? Oh, yes. So um, for my PhD work, I studied stochastic uh, PDEs, partial differential equations, of a specific kind of fluid flow or, or for a specific kind of uh, fluid. And these fluids are called non-Newtonian fluids. Um, they act slightly differently than, for example, say water. And blood is a non-Newtonian fluid. So I'm just building up uh, on my PhD work where now I'm coupling my system to also include for the moving artery, for example. Okay. Um, and I, what first inspired your interest in modeling fluid structure interaction? Uh, my PhD work, uh, for one, uh, I had um, uh, read a few papers and I had been introduced to FSI a little bit uh, thanks to my PhD advisor. Uh, but since I came here, of course, uh, because my um, uh, research interests aligned with Professor Chanich, uh, I've been exposed to this uh, field even more. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. How so, so? Are these these fluid structure interaction models of cardiovascular systems? Uh, can they be used in clinical contexts to, for example, address heart disease or design better stents, etc.? Yes, to design better stents, uh, to figure out what happens at arterial bifurcations, uh, to see interaction between blood and, say, a thrombus, they're the, the applications of accountants. Oh, well, and uh, okay, maybe one more question. What, what is an application to geophysics for simulating fluid structure interaction? Oh yes, there are there are many applications in the in the field of geophysics as well. Um, for example, uh, what happens uh, the interaction between volcanoes uh, or or the lava that's that an er erupting volcanoes spills out uh, with the structures around it, or the groundwater with any kind of structure on top of it, or the uh, ocean waves with any coastal structures that that are uh, present. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's sure. move on to our final speaker this evening, um, Professor Olga Holtz. So Olga Holtz is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at UC Berkeley and a visiting professor of applied mathematics at Technical University of Berlin and Berlin Mathematical School. Her research interests include classical analysis, 
numerical analysis, matrix and operator theory, approximation theory, orthogonal polynomials, commutative algebra, wavelets and splines, compressive sensing, probability, and computational complexity. Her work has received many awards, including Sofia Kovalevskaya Award, the European Mathematical Society Prize, an ERC starting grant, uh, and two von Neumann fellowships at the Institute for Advanced Study and an AMS fellowship. Professor Holtz is also an award-winning screenwriter and film director. Olga, please tell us about your research. Thank you, Pear, for this lovely introduction. Um, let's get going. This is the view from my office and, and at, um, at Evans Hall. And these uh, images here are a couple of mathematical visions that I will try to describe in my talk. And my theme today is complexity and linear algebra. So I should mention, um, you probably already got that idea from Pear's intro, uh, but let me, let me say it again, this is not everything I do. This is just one aspect of my work, but this is perhaps the easiest to appreciate and um, the most practical. So why linear algebra and why do we need to do it fast? So if we're talking about real world problems of science and engineering, then they are typically solved as we already heard from my two colleagues through linearization. So Pierre talked about mesh generation and discretizing problems. And then um, um, we heard also about methods in fluid dynamics that all use uh, linearization schemes. So this requires manipulating typically huge amounts of data, uh, organizing them into rectangular arrays, which are called matrices, and then performing matrix computations. So numerical linear algebra is precisely the, the, brand of the, the branch of mathematics and computer science that deals with algorithms, with their, with their design, with their analysis in order to perform those matrix computations. And of all the algorithms in that world, matrix multiplication has a distinguished role, not just because it's the workhorse of numerical linear algebra, but also because it's arithmetic complexity that, that means the number of operations required to perform it um, dictates, determines um, the arithmetic complexity of essentially all other direct methods. And so that's a very special problem, as you can tell. Now, why do we need to perform matrix multiplication fast? Because basically everything you use, matrix multiplication or matrix decompositions and so forth, everything that uses um, linearization or, or linear, linear techniques um, typically needs to be done repeatedly. And even if we're talking about computer games, then you're repeatedly multiplying matrices or decomposing matrices in real time when you're rendering your you know, virtual reality and, and things like that. And then this a problem is ubiquitous as we, as we know in all of applied science. So um, many of you have taken linear algebra here. And so probably you, you might wonder, um, I know how to multiply matrices. Um, you know, we were taught how to multiply matrices. So where is the problem there? Um, is there anything to discover? So it turns out that there is a lot to discover and some of the um, content there is, is very um, involved mathematically. So in 1969, uh, Volker Strassen, trying to actually prove that the standard matrix multiplication is optimal, uh, to his shock, discovered that that was not the case. And that's uh, on this slide, you see a summary of his discovery. This is the precise method that he found. And this is based on a very simple, if perhaps somewhat unorthodox way of multiplying two by two matrices. So instead of performing the usual eight multiplications, Strassen found a way to do it using only seven multiplications. And now if you use this recursively by repeatedly splitting your matrices into um, square blocks, and we imagine that all matrices are square for this problem, although this is really not a loss of generality. So if you do this recursively, 
you will get a method whose complexity is arithmetic complexity is n to the power log base two of seven, which is approximately 2.81, as opposed to the usual n to the power log base two of eight, uh, which is n cubed, right? That's the method that is, that is taught in linear algebra one or one or whatever your first course in linear algebra was. Okay, so once uh, people got over that shock, they started improving on Strassen's method. So Strassen himself and various other mathematicians proposed a series of improvements culminating in the current record, which is approximately 2.37188. And that's um, the record for the so-called exponent of matrix multiplication, namely the number to which you're raising n. And remember, n is the size of your matrix. That is the size of your problem, the one dimension size of your problem. So the whole matrix arrays of order n squared. And um, the mathematics involved there actually quickly gets very complicated. So uh, Strassen himself discovered that the complexity of matrix multiplication, the same arithmetic complexity of matrix multiplication can be measured by um, a notion which is known as the border rank of a special tensor. And it's specially constructed for this problem. It's called the matrix multiplication tensor. Now Strassen also proposed what's known now as Strassen's laser method, which um, and that gets a little technical. So apologies um, for those who might be a little bit um, you know, further away from that world. So it starts with a tensor of near minimal border rank, builds a large tensor from it using some sort of um, basic construction tools. And then that tensor admits what's called a degeneration to a large matrix multiplication tensor. And all advances since 1987 and so far were based on the big coppersmith vinaigrette tensor named after two mathematicians who proposed that, that specific construction. Now, unfortunately, in recent years and in the last decade, barriers were identified to the, this method, barriers to obtaining better and better upper bounds. But simultaneously or nearly simultaneously, and in fact, over the last two years, especially new proposals were made, how to handle these barriers, how to, to overcome those barriers by using specific techniques in algebraic geometry. And I should mention that algebraic geometry is usually thought of as a very theoretical kind of mathematics. So here you see the interplay between something extremely theoretical and something um, in theoretical computer science, right, complexity theory, which in turn translates into practical, practical implementation and practical consequences. So, uh, speaking of the interplay between theory and practice, as you guys know, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. And so in practice, we exceedingly have to deal not just with the arithmetic costs, but with another kind of cost, which we usually call communication, communication or input output complexity. So what is this about? On top of arithmetic, that is floating point operations, we need to worry about moving data between levels of a memory hierarchy in the so-called sequential case or over network connecting processors, which would be in the parallel case. And so that is the notion of communication in, that we can use in this context. So if we care to save time and save energy, we need to think not just about optimizing the arithmetic here, but also optimizing communication. And um, in fact, we need to worry about communication a whole lot more these days than about arithmetic. So here's a picture um, illustrating uh, Moore's law over the last couple of decades. So what you see here is this consistent performance improvements in CPU, uh, uh, speeds, here you see about 59% improvement per year, as opposed to access memory access speeds, where you only see 23% per year, roughly, that's, that's the average values. Um, and so um, optimizing for communication and minimizing communication becomes a bottleneck. And so that was the source of some of my work, a lot of my work over the last uh, number of years where many colleagues and, and myself obtained 
managed to obtain lower and upper bounds for various uh, linear algebraic algorithms for so all sorts of factorizations, LU, Koleski, QR. If you ever use linear algebra, you probably heard of those um, for eigenvalue and, and single value problems. And in fact, for almost all direct methods of linear algebra. And this research um, can be applied in the world of dense or sparse matrices. We have effective bounds in, in that world as well, in terms of the sparsity that we are given. And also these results apply in the world of uh, optimization, specifically graph optimization problems. And of course it applies very much to the, face, uh, to the fast matrix multiplication techniques. So just two words about methods that we use. I think there were some good questions in the chat about like, what do you actually, do? what is this stuff that you learned as an undergraduate that you found useful? So here are some examples of um, geometric inequalities that you may or may not have uh, heard of as an undergraduate, but they are certainly elementary in the sense that they can be taught to undergraduates. And so here's a, a famous result of, of Loomis and Whitney in its simplest form. And so you can recognize this as one of my visions from the first slide. So this is the very basic result itself from 1949. And now there are many generalizations and many improvements on that and very sophisticated versions of this inequality that initially connected the volume of a three-dimensional set to the areas of its shadows, its projections. And another kind of technique comes from a very different place, namely graph theory, where we can use the notion of graph expansion to analyze what's called the computational graph of our algorithm. So it's a huge graph typically that describes how an algorithm works. So it, it connects intermediate inputs and outputs. And then by looking at the graph expansion and analyzing um, the computation graphs of our algorithms, we are able to derive those bounds, those lower bounds, and ideally also those upper bounds on communication. And so that's the second little picture from my first slide. As you can see, this is the actual uh, computational graph for the Strassen algorithm only done once, right? At level one, at recursion level one. So, um, these were just a couple of things I wanted to share with you, and I am happy to stop here and open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. So let me follow up with a few questions. Um, so um, this fast linear algebra, is it important to industry and or private companies investing in, for example, ways to optimize the communication? So, so basically, you always have some sort of linear algebraic uh, methods probably used if you're doing anything numerical, then probably you want to be to be using um, matrix, you know, numerical linear algebra, matrix methods. And so depending on your needs, maybe you need to perform single value decomposition repeatedly, right? Or maybe you want to do some other, maybe you want to do search repeatedly that that is basically using matrix uh you know powers of a single matrix and so if your matrix is huge and you have to do this repeated operations especially if you have to do them in real time then yeah absolutely you might have a parallel cluster that you use or you, you might have you know just a couple of machines put together but then obviously you, you want to spend as little time as possible performing those tasks. And so then you want to go for the fastest practically, you know, implementable uh, kind of method that, and so probably you would want to use something of the sort that we, we develop. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's very applied in that sense. Now, since I got the question of AI, maybe I'll ask you the same. Uh, and what, what's your uh, interaction with AI in, in your research and this topic and and, and in general, um, uh, for example, on, uh, on, on, your, on these types of algorithms and, and big data? 
So this is an excellent question. Actually, very recently, and if I can share my screen again, I'm happy to actually even. Wow. Yeah. So, so this is a recent paper from the fall of last year where a team, um, a deep mind team, you know, you see many, many authors there, co-authors on this paper, um, used AI, so basically used uh, the search techniques based on AI-based search techniques to find an instance of small size matrix multiplication, which was better than the state, the, the state of the art for that size. And so remember Strassen, right? Strassen is a two by two times two by two matrix multiplication, which, which can, when, when applied recursively, leads to a fast method. And so here they discovered a different method. Um, so this, the improvement over the state of the art was for four by four, I believe in that, the, that work. They explored some other things, but they didn't find, you know, maybe something better than the state of the art. But now, um, not to say it, not to mean anything derogatory about the AI, I should mention that two of my co authors have students who, on their laptops, were able to find uh, methods going beyond the state of the art for small size matrices. So I'm saying probably the most. Um, you know, progress we can make is obviously by involving AI, by, by involving it smartly, right? By combining it with the ideas we already have as mathematicians and not performing some wild search over, you know, a huge number of sort of search parameters, but trying to, to be clever about it, right? And trying to optimize. So we are very much interested in working with the industry and I'm actually reaching out to some people right now, you know, working in the industry, trying to see how we can, you know, how we can help them and they can help us. Yeah, it makes sense. I, th I think that's what many feel about the AI field. All right, let's move on. Thank you so much, Olga. And I would like you to stay uh, with me and invite uh, Kritika back because we're going to do spend the remaining time to address some of the additional questions that are maybe more broad or uh, that relate to all of uh, the talks that we've had here. Let me start with uh, some of the questions from the audience. Uh, let's see, here's a quite specific one uh, about our courses and how it relates. Maybe I'm, I'm actually vice chair for undergrad and curriculum chair. Maybe I could <laughs> you start take by that. saying, so the question is, in terms of the UC Berkeley undergraduate curriculum, are topics like Math 104 and Math 110 really necessary to study computational methods? So uh, let me explain to everybody that Math 104 uh, is our real analysis course, upper, the food. And one of the first upper level courses our math majors take, both, both the pure and the applied ones. And the 110 is a advanced or abstract linear algebra, more proof-based. And is this necessary to study computational methods? Mm -hmm. um, as a mathematician, maybe I should say yes, but let me say clearly the answer is no, because every department in engineering and science have classes in computational methods and numerical methods. And not their students, some do take these uh, real analysis courses, but they do not, not all of them. So you can certainly study computation without having that theoretical background. You can implement them, you can learn how to use them. Uh, I would say that if you really want to learn how to study numerical methods or numerical analysis, how to, for example, prove correctness, et cetera, we use results from these courses and then it becomes important. So I would say not critical for computational science, but maybe on the more mathematical side of, of computational science and the study of the algorithms. That would be something where we would use it. But I'd like to ask uh, uh, Kritika and uh, Olga, if you have any comments on this, would you, do you how, how much of the of, of, of real analysis and, and abstract linear algebra do you feel we need in our work? Um, I agree with Per. I think, uh, when it comes to um, understanding the mathematical analysis behind that goes behind uh, these equations, I think that's when having a solid 104 background is important. But I also agree with him when he says uh, that other departments offer different kinds of numerical uh, methods, classes, and maybe 104 is uh, not necessary or a prerequisite for those courses. 
I, I think we should distinguish between um, using something uh, more or less as a black box, right, and being a competent user of algorithms, as opposed to being a developer and, um, you know, as a researcher that needs to develop algorithms, maybe improve on the existing ones or develop completely new ones. So for those um, interested in truly understanding what's going on, I think some kind of class, not necessarily one of four per se, but some class in real analysis like one of four would be in, incredibly important. And then likewise with 110, if you want to do anything linear algebraic, then you do need to understand the core subject, I would say so. Um, but if you just want to be a competent user, you can uh, function well without maybe such detailed knowledge. It, ultimately, the question is, you know, what's the ultimate what, what's the ultimate goal that you have here? And I think some of the goals of education might not be just the ease of doing something later, right? But also actually just improve, becoming a, 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 a better thinker, right? Becoming a deeper thinker and, and understanding the, the underlying reasons for, for various phenomena in mathematics. Why, why does something work the way it does, right? So that's my, uh, that's my take. Yeah, no, I agree. That, that's uh, so. It's a great question, and it, it all fits together, I guess. Uh, we had another math one of four question, <laughs> and and I think we kind of uh, addressed that a little bit and how it it's used for addressing these applied things. Uh, one in our audience asked the difference. What is the difference between computation and simulation? Um, Never quite thought of it. I don't know if you got simulation is definitely used when you try to simulate something. For example, you try to model physics or the 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 world, etc. And computation does not have to do that. <laughs> you could you could compute anything, and it's a computation, right? So, what do you guys feel? Is is that? Did you know the? I guess we could Wikipedia the definition, but but in our field, what do you feel? Computation versus simulation. Simulations involve computations. I, I agree. It's kind of a relation like that, right? Yeah, you get a compute to simulate something. Yeah. Right. So you need to, you probably need to compute to simulate something. But the actual process of simulating is the model building process, right? When you first build the model of your phenomena, whether real or imaginary, right? And then you start actually um, rendering. Uh, the con right, computing the consequence of this model and then perhaps rendering them in some sort of um, environments in some shape or, or form. And so that that's where computation comes in. So we can compute indeed, right? So computation doesn't have to come from simulation per se. Computation can have various sources. Yeah, I think that's what I feel too. But, but it's, it's funny because we don't really address uh... These uh, <laughs> these things we don't we just use the terms we don't think so much. Well, Per, per you told us about the model building stage of your work, right? Where you first need to understand how to represent a That's phenomenon. Right. phenomenon. And so, for example, the work that I do already deals with something that is already in mathematical form, right? So we don't need to necessarily worry, at least at my end, right? I typically don't need to build the model myself. Yeah, let's squish in one quick question, uh, a great question that is very broad and uh, and I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about it. What advances or breakthroughs do you envision in applied mathematics in the next few years? <laughs> Ritika, do you want to go first? In applied mathematics? Yes. Oh, in my, um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> or in your field, if you wish. Question. Mm -hmm. Or in just your field, if you want to narrow it down. Uh, I guess uh, in, in my field, or at least pertaining to the, the talk that I gave today, um, I would assume more um, well-posedness results. Again, by well-posedness, I, I just mean uh, you want to figure out whether a model makes sense so that numerically you have 
the numerical so so solutions that you get are meaningful and more uh, and, and not unstable. So uh, this uh, these moving boundary problems uh, became a, a uh, huge in mathematical community uh, only over the last 10 to 20 years. So I actually envision a lot of breakthroughs where a lot of low positiveness results are uh, in the future. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Olga, what do you feel? What big thing is going to happen? Well, uh, it's, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, right? <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, I am... I, on a good day, I think that you know the problem I told you guys about, um, namely the exponent of matrix multiplication, is going to be resolved, and namely brought all the way down to two. That's sort of the wild hope that many of us have in the community. We have some reasons to believe that it might be possible, but there is not, you know, very straightforward reasons. For example, the fast Fourier transform can be performed in the, you know, in time equal to the size of the problem times the logarithm of the problem. And here the size of the problem is n squared. So we are hoping for something of that sort, right? But this, as I said, that's a wild hope. Ideally, you know, in an ideal world, I would love to see that the complexity of matrix multiplication, it can be brought down to n squared log n, you know, that, that would be fantastic. Um, um, I'm also curious about the world of cryptography and the underlying math problems there. Um, so factoring large integers uh, is behind a lot of crypto cryptographic techniques, most of them, as a matter of fact. And we still don't know what the complexity of that problem is, which is tantalizing because all our uh, e-commerce and secure communication, not in the sense that I spoke about, but in the sense of sending and receiving you know, messages, secret information, right? All of this is based on the supposed hardness of factoring. Um, but actually, we don't even know if this is a, if, if this is actually true. So I'm very curious, and I think that we should see some results in that in that area. So yeah, okay. um, I'm not willing to make a prediction one way or, or the other, but it could be fun to see, you know, how it turns out. Yeah. All right. So for me, just a short answer to that is AI. I, not that I completely believe in it. I'm skeptical, but I, everybody's working on it uh, and it's amazing in other fields. So I'm hoping the next few years that, it, that our field will also see big impact on that. But we're going to have to end it there and I'm going to hand it back to, to Maria Young, who, you, who spoke in the beginning. Maria, go ahead. Thank you, um, Per and Olga and Kritika. Those were amazing um, presentations. I know that when I can follow them, um, they're, they're, they're excellent. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful and I get very excited um, when I see the faculty whom I represent um, get their research out into the world. So, and thank you all for, for joining us tonight for Basic Science Lights the Way. Um, so, you know, the next event is on in this virtual series is on April 17th and it will cover the topic of biological repair and regeneration. We will hear from three faculty members from the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology about their research. We hope to see you there. Um, please reach out to us if you would like to learn more about anything we covered. I feel badly because a couple um, questions came in at the end that we didn't quite get to. Um, we will be sharing additional resources to you by email about today's topics and speakers. And a vi video of today's session will be available at our Basic Science Lights the Way website about a week from now. Um, so you can always come back to that website to watch things you missed. And in fact, if you're interested in some of these math topics, there are a few um, videos from past sessions um, that cover a few things like quantum computing, for example. I saw a question about that. Um, anyway, thank you for attending and showing such interest in uh, the research and discoveries that come out of mathematical and physical sciences here at Berkeley. We couldn't do it without you and your support, and thank you to our wonderful speakers. And if you're celebrating the first night of Passover, please have a very happy one. Until next time, stay curious, fiat lux, and go Bears! <laughs>